Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Arun Shravatsa. Dr. Shravatsa completed his undergraduate training at St. Joseph's College in Bangalore, India. He graduated from Bangalore Medical College. He completed his internal medicine residency as well as a gastroenterology fellowship at the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. Dr. Shravatsa is board certified in internal medicine and board eligible in gastroenterology. So I was um, assigned a topic of liver disease to uh, talk to you folks out there today. Um, this is a talk from a layman's uh, perspective to understand more about liver disease, how the liver is affected by various uh, conditions, and how liver disease can be prevented and better managed. Um, so I'm going to start off here by um, providing a brief outline of today's talk. Um, we'll start off with what uh, the liver normally does, so the normal functions, and what cirrhosis means uh, to those of you who may not know what cirrhosis of the liver means, and what causes liver damage or cirrhosis, and the various types of liver disease that are prevalent today, including uh, what's known as NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is a fancy way of saying fatty liver. So uh, we'll talk about that. And the various, uh, the viruses that may cause liver disease, including hepatitis A, B, and C. Um, we're going to talk about some medicines that damage the liver, alcohol. And then we'll move on to um, what symptoms you might have if you're uh, suffering from liver disease and how to manage them. So um, this is how the liver normally looks. Um, it's a reasonably big organ and it lies right there in the uh, middle of your belly, a little towards the right hand side. And you can see the gallbladder, which is the organ that stores the juice that's produced by the liver. Um, so it's, it's a pretty vital organ. It's, it's uh, very important to, um, uh, to the human body to have a healthy functioning liver. It's the largest organ inside the human body. Um, and it has several uh, functions that it does. So most importantly, um, it digests or helps in digestion. And what it is, is it's a sort of a processing, packaging, and shipping factory that takes the food that you digest and then sort of ships it like a warehouse to various parts of your body, like the muscles and the fat stores and your brain and heart and kidneys. Apart from that, it has uh, 500 other uh, vital functions that we're not going to go into, but uh, pretty much is summed up by this sort of table here. Um, so it's important for immunity. It uh, produces blood clotting factors. Um, it also produces various proteins and amino acids, cholesterol, and also clears certain uh, waste products through the bile. So. Um, Bile, just to get into a little more about bile, that's, that's the major uh, secretory product of the liver. Um, it not only digests food, but it also carries certain uh, waste products within it that may be excreted through your stool. This is a schematic of how um, bile that's produced in the liver drains, is stored in the gallbladder, and then goes into your intestines. Um, so just to uh, repeat some of the other functions, it converts extra glucose and stores it. It produces blood clotting substances, so that becomes important because in liver damage, um, one tends to bleed more easily, and that's known as coagulopathy or just an increased tendency to bleed. 
It also stores iron, and that's important because one of the genetic diseases uh, that the liver can get affected with is a disorder of iron storage where there's too much iron in your body. It's called hemochromatosis, and we'll talk a little bit about that. It does manufacture cholesterol, and in fact, one of the signs of end-stage liver disease is your cholesterol actually is low, but that's probably not a good thing because the liver is too damaged by that time. It also produces uh, amino acids, which are sort of the building blocks for proteins. And that's why you see people with liver disease, they have very less muscle mass because they're so weak because their liver is not producing enough protein. And this really is the um, most important function. It, it removes various toxins and wastes, just like the kidneys do. But unfortunately, unlike the kidney where dialysis is an option when the kidneys start to fail, um, right now, liver dialysis is not mainstream yet. It sort of is a research protocol. Um, so when the liver does get damaged, um, these waste products accumulate, and they uh, are part of what causes the symptoms of liver disease. So this diagram you've uh, just seen a little while ago, and this is the normal liver. And I'm going to show you a picture of how the liver looks when it's damaged. So you can see this is how cirrhosis looks. It's uh, shrunken, fibrotic, and scarred um, from whatever disease process um, caused it to get damaged. So what causes liver disease or end-stage liver disease that's known as cirrhosis? Right now, the hot topic is fatty liver or what's known as NASH. It's non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And this is by far becoming the most common type or the most rapidly increasing type of liver damage in the United States today. Viral hepatitis, hepatitis B and C, is, has been there for decades. It sort of fluctuates depending on how healthy um, lifestyle practices are. But certainly there's more knowledge out there and people are definitely trying to prevent transmission of hepatitis B and C, but we still do see a fair share. Alcohol, and then certain various other conditions, one of them being autoimmune hepatitis, can cause liver damage. Um, these uh, conditions, um, excuse me there, these three conditions, autoimmune hepatitis, PBC, which is primary biliary cirrhosis, and PSC, which is primary sclerosing cholangitis, these are rare causes, um, but they, stu uh, they still do affect a fair share of the population. So usually your doctor will look for these through blood tests or imaging such as ultrasound or MRI when you're, when you're going to see them for liver disease. But by far, the first three, fatty liver, viral hepatitis, and alcohol uh, form a large chunk of end-stage liver disease or cirrhosis. Genetic causes. Um, can or genetic um, predisposition to liver disease can occur in three conditions, most commonly in the US. One is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which may affect the lungs or the liver or both. So you can have emphysema and liver disease in that um, genetic condition. Wilson's disease can affect the brain and the liver, so you may have psychiatric uh, manifestations as well as liver disease in that condition. And I talked about iron overload, which is hemochromatosis, and that's a genetic uh, condition where there's excess iron in the body that then damages the liver amongst other organs. Again, these are extremely rare, but when someone comes in with liver disease, these will be looked for to make sure that these are not playing a role. So coming to um, the first part of our talk today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit and dwell on this uh, subject here. Uh, and this is fatty liver disease, also known as NASH, which uh, is an acronym for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which basically means your liver has a lot of fat in it. It's getting inflamed and get, getting affected by this fat. And the fat is coming not from alcohol. In other words, you're not drinking a lot of alcohol and therefore getting fat in the liver, 
but you're getting it from other causes such as your diet or your lifestyle. So this is an interesting graphic. So this is a chart from the CDC. Um, and this is the prevalence of obesity among US adults in the year 1985. So they had two colors. One was less than 10%, one was 10 to 14% for the prevalence of obesity in 1985. And you can see most states were doing pretty good. Um, and a few states had more obese people. And then I'm going to scroll through the chart here, 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90. All right, so that's how the prevalence of obesity increased and by now almost the entire continental U.S. is having a significant prevalence of obesity. 1993, 94, 95. In 97, they had to get a new color in because now more than 15% of the population in some states was obese. And as you scroll down, coming into 2002 and 3 and 4, there's another new color where 24% of the population is now beginning to be obese in certain states. And this is 2004. 2009, 2010, 30% or so of the population. And now you can see in almost every state, more than 15% of the population being obese. So just going from these trends, um, the CDC is quite alarmed um, that obesity is going to be the nation's leading killer in terms of health care. So when people talk about the obesity ep epidemic, I mean, there, there is definitely a lot of denial. But one of the bad effects of obesity is fatty liver. And let's try and understand a little more about that. So as you can see, the, the prevalence of obesity has been steadily increasing. It's probably more than doubled over the past several decades. And there's some thought that high fructose corn syrup, which is actually a quite commonly found sweetener in most processed and packaged foods, is probably the leading cause of this. And part of the research goes back to um, the, the delicacy in certain gourmet restaurants known as foie gras, which is fatty liver of geese. And they, they produce that by force feeding cornmeal to certain geese um, that are especially bred for this purpose. Um, without getting into the politics of that, in geese, um, apparently it's, it's a method for, for them to store excess nutrients. But in humans, the liver wasn't designed to be a storage uh, organ, for fat especially. So that's probably why fat causes inflammation in the liver. And it, it resembles the more common alcoholic fatty liver disease. So 30 years ago, if someone had fatty liver, most likely they were alcoholic. Today, most likely they're not. Most likely they're either overweight or obese. Um, and the fat itself builds up in the liver cell till it becomes so inflamed that it cannot do its regular job, which then starts leading to inflammation, cell death, and then eventually to liver damage and cirrhosis. So how do we prevent fatty liver? An ideal body weight, and you can find your ideal body weight by looking at your height and cat calculating what's known as your body mass index. Your body mass index should be between 25 to 28. There's several online calculators that help you determine your body mass index. Or when you visit your doctor, they can calculate it for you, measuring your height and weight at the same time. We spoke about high fructose corn syrup. And you can probably look at food labels to see if there's high fructose corn syrup, and try and start avoiding those, especially if you're overweight or obese, or you have fatty liver or liver disease of any sort. 
how do we treat fatty liver? Well, someone said lose weight, so that's definitely one good thing. Uh, but other than that, unfortunately, there's not much good treatment. There has been no miracle medicine that helps you lose weight. And there's no liver-specific medicine that treats fatty liver. Recently, there was a study uh, which was published last year in the New England Journal that showed that vitamin E in high doses, you can purchase this over the counter. It comes in 400 units per capsule. So if you take two capsules a day, it may reduce the damage that's being caused by fatty liver. But even that, the, the benefit was modest, so we cannot expect a cure. So, um, as someone said, lose weight to achieve or go towards your ideal body mass index. If you do have diabetes, control that and avoid anything that can damage your liver further, such as alcohol and any toxic medications or, or uh, toxins. So um, moving on to the next part, um, we're going to talk a little bit about viral hepatitis. So what sort of viruses may affect your liver? Starting from the influenza virus to uh, several common cold and other types of viruses and bacteria, a lot of uh, infections may affect your liver, but the most common ones are hepatitis A, B, and C. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Hepatitis A is usually uh, acquired by uh, taking or consuming food or water that's been contaminated um, with someone else's secretions that had hepatitis A. So usually it's pretty rare in the US, but you do see outbreaks from time to time with food products that have been contaminated in the food chain. Um, the good news is the liver usually recovers uh, without any treatment, just supportive care, and usually does not cause um, cirrhosis or long-lasting damage. And food hygiene is pretty well, um, I would say, developed here in the United States as compared to other countries. But um, raw seafood, such as oysters, mussels, can still transmit hepatitis A, and we do see some of these outbreaks in coastal towns, even in the United States. Hepatitis B, on the other hand, um, is usually spread by bodily contact with blood or other body fluids. Um, used to be transmitted by blood transfusions, but that's pretty rare now because blood is screened for hepatitis B. Hepatitis C and hepatitis B are usually transmitted the same way. Hepatitis B can get better by itself, and that's known as what's, uh, what we call acute hepatitis B. But most of the time, hepatitis B lingers, and that's known as the chronic phase, where you have hepatitis B and it never goes away unless you're treated. And in that situation, it may last throughout your life, and then in that situation may lead to liver failure, even liver cancer. Hepatitis C itself um, is transmitted the same way, either through IV drug abuse where people share needles or through high risk um, sexual practices. And similar to hepatitis B, usually it um, doesn't get better by itself. Um, and may also lead to cirrhosis or uh, liver cancer. So there are some vaccines for hepatitis, but not for hep C. So the vaccines that are available are for hepatitis A and B. Um, and a lot of uh, people here may have already been vaccinated. All newborns in the United States now get vaccinated automatically for hepatitis A and B. So how do we treat these uh, types of hepatitis? Hepatitis B uh, requires a long-term commitment to taking pills. Um, usually you can get away with taking one or two pills a day, depending on which is appropriate for you. Uh, but it, it does require monitoring, and we'll come to that in a second. Um, 
for very few people with certain genotypes in hepatitis B, they can be treated with interferon to help the liver clear the virus, although this may not be an option for everyone. The key, though, to hepatitis B is because it's a chronic condition, it requires periodic monitoring. And that includes getting your blood work checked to see how the liver is doing. And this is known as liver function tests. They measure the liver enzymes. The viral load, which is the level of the viral DNA in your blood. And certain specific antigens that the virus produces. And certain antibodies that your body produces against those antigens. So these may be checked every 6 to 12 months, depending on your condition and um, how often you need it. Because the, the virus can also increase your risk to develop liver cancer, uh, people do need a periodic every six to 12 month, maybe ultrasound and a blood tumor marker called alpha feta protein. So coming to the medications that you can take for hep B, uh, these medications usually are prescribed by a liver specialist or a gastroenterologist. The oldest one is Epivir or Lamivudine. Since then, several new ones have come out, including Adefovir, the Interferon, which is an injection, Entecavir or Baraclode, and Tenofovir. This is not an exhaustive list, so if you're on a medication other than these, uh, it might still be effective. But these are the most common medications one would use to treat hepatitis B. Usually one would need a single medicine. Sometimes there is combination treatment that is used. And usually treatment is lifelong, unless you clear the virus, which happens, but in a small percentage of patients. So how do we prevent hepatitis B? I think this, this is key uh, for, for the public to know. So if, if someone already has hepatitis B, they should make sure that their sexual contacts are vaccinated. They should not share toothbrushes. That would probably be common sense, but it's useful to throw that out there. Not donate blood. If you do donate blood, you will, the blood will be discarded because the Red Cross does check for hepatitis B. And obviously, stop using IV drugs. If, you, if the patient still continues to use IV drugs, they should at least stop sharing needles. Um, so those would be the main methods of preventing hepatitis B. Moving on to hepatitis C, this is a slightly different uh, method of um, approaching treatment because this uh, virus can actually be cleared by the human body with a little help in a significant proportion of patients from 30 to 60, maybe even 75 percent, depending on which genotype of hepatitis C you have, um, you could successfully clear this virus with treatment. Although the treatment uh, is more than just a pill, there is a pill and an injectable medication known as pegintiferon. And usually treatment lasts 6 to 12 months. And in that time period, a lucky 30 to 60 percent will clear this virus. There are um, newer medications that may be even more effective. So if someone has hepatitis C and they've been waiting to get treatment, this may be uh, as good a time as any because these new medications, which are bosepravir and telaprevir, um, seem to have a better track record. Maybe up to 60 to 80 percent of people can get rid of this virus. Um, in a one-year time period. So hepatitis C also requires certain monitoring uh, to be performed to make sure you're not going downhill when you have this. So that includes the same liver function tests. The hepatitis C also has its RNA in blood that can be monitored. And it includes monitoring for liver cancer, which you are at increased risk if you have hepatitis C. 
Uh, that would include getting a periodic ultrasound and a blood tumor marker called alpha beta protein. So this is a poster that you might have seen um, out in um, various healthcare um, centers. So basically hepatitis C, the most common method of spread right now is IV drug abuse. And um, so this is sort of a message out there to people who may still be using IV drugs and may find it difficult to get off it, but at least they stop sharing their needles. Apart from that, obviously, stop sharing other, uh, other implements that may be in contact with body fluids, such as toothbrushes. Don't donate blood. So we talked a little bit about viruses that damage the liver. The next part of the talk, we're going to talk about medications. And this may come as a surprise to some folks out there, but there are a lot of over-the-counter medications and several prescription medications that even though they're used with good intention, both by the patient and by the physician prescribing them, to treat something unrelated, they may innocuously affect your liver. So it is important to read those labels um, or those little pamphlets you get from your pharmacist when you get a medication with all those lists of side effects. Unfortunately, that, that does need to be read. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about these medications. Some of them are over the counter, most common one being acetaminophen or the brand name being Tylenol, but it's available in several other over the counter um, preparations. Um, certain antibiotics, most notorious being Augmentin, which is commonly used for people who have a skin infection or a lung infection even. Certain heart medications such as amiodarone, uh, another antibiotic or antifungal agent like fluconazole, diclofenac is a pain medication, thorazine sometimes is used for nausea. These can all affect your liver. Um, Younger uh, ladies who still use oral contraceptives, that's one of the side effects is it rarely can affect your liver. Middle-aged uh, folks with high cholesterol, uh, most of you who take a statin, any medicine that ends with the phrase statin, such as pravastatin, uh, atorvastatin, so these are the brand names, um, need their liver tests monitored, especially the first few weeks when you start taking that medication. And there's several other medicines. Uh, most of these will be monitored by your physician, but it's always worth knowing so you're aware of this. So if you do take Tylenol, the recommendation is you don't take more than 1,000 milligrams each time, and don't take more than four grams per day. And the caveat to that is if you're drinking alcohol, don't take more than two grams per day because alcohol will increase the toxicity of Tylenol. So don't swallow that pill with a shot or a margarita. Um, and the other key point is if your doctor says, you know what, this medicine may affect your liver, let's monitor this with blood work, make sure you get that blood work done. Because frequently you're like, yep, we need to get this blood work done, but let me start taking my pill, and then a month later you've forgotten all about it. And as I said, uh, the dosing guidelines or the pamphlet of information that comes with each medicine, um, so that needs to be read. You need to ask your pharmacist or your doctor if you have any questions about that. So we're, we're going to move on here to um, how alcohol affects your liver. So most people think one drink a day is uh, probably OK. Most people would say that, maybe, maybe not. Unfortunately, um, not everyone's idea of one drink is uh, the same. You know, So one drink a day or one glass a day, it depends how much you're actually drinking. So there are some guidelines. Um, 12 ounces of beer, an ounce and a half of hard liquor, or a five ounce glass of wine. And you notice the wine glass, a half full. So 
when you say you're having a glass of wine, you know, we need to be careful about those measurements there. But this is, uh, this is a unit of alcohol. It's known as one alcoholic drink. High risk alcohol intake um, is more prevalent in uh, folks who are drinking more than 14 drinks per week in the case of men or more than four drinks per occasion. That's, uh, you know, you sit down, it, it may be a Saturday night, you, you know, you're watching a game or, or something, you're out at a party, but more than four drinks, you're, you're already at risk for um, liver damage. For ladies, it's uh, more than seven drinks a week or more than three, three drinks uh, per occasion. And the recommendations uh, for low-risk low drinking are not more than two drinks per day for men and not more than one drink per day for women. Reason being the, the female liver is smaller in size and also there's some suggestion that the female hormones may um, facilitate liver damage from alcohol. And if you're over 65, no more than one drink per day either. So having said that, um, we're going to go on to um, some symptoms of liver disease. Um, unfortunately, these are pretty nonspecific in the early stages. So you may have no symptoms at all, despite the fact that your liver is getting damaged, or they may be really nonspecific. So um, although these can vary depending on the type of liver disease you have, most commonly it would be lack of appetite, maybe nausea and vomiting, and throwing up blood or having blood in the bowel movements. That would be a real concerning uh, symptom, as I'm sure all of you would agree. Pain over the liver area, which is usually the right-hand side of your upper belly, could be underneath your rib cage. And finally, yellowing of your skin or your eyes or a really dark yellow urine. And that's termed as jaundice. And once liver disease starts progressing, that's when you start seeing swelling of your lower legs that's known as edema. But again, these are pretty nonspecific. You can have um, edema in heart conditions or kidney failure. And um, you can have these uh, symptoms in various other illnesses as well. So these are not specific by any means. So going on to the signs, what the physician looks for when you go in for a physical and you have liver disease, we're looking for the complications of cirrhosis. And the complications of cirrhosis, one of them is increased fluid in the belly, which we can examine for, and that's known as ascites. We're going to look for evidence of bleeding, and you usually bleed from blood vessels that get engorged in your food pipe or in other parts of your intestines. And those are known as varices. People with liver disease, sometimes they seem a little off. If you have a relative or a friend, um, they may seem confused. They may seem sleepy during the day. They may perk up at night. So this is known as encephalopathy. And in more severe cases, they may be comatose unarousable. And finally, we are going to look for a liver cancer, which can occur in end-stage liver damage. So we're going to talk a little bit about these various um, symptoms and signs. So this is a distended belly with fluid inside, and you see the belly button is sort of an Audi, and that's, uh, that's a sign of ascites. So how do we manage fluid in the belly? And this, is, this is a condition that you see in end-stage liver disease. So we tell uh, people with this end-stage, uh, with this much of liver damage that they need to start restricting salt in their diet. They need to go to a two gram sodium restricted diet. So they need to actually read the labels and tally up how much sodium or salt they take during the day. And then we help the body lose fluid and salt by giving them water pills or diuretics. Uh, most commonly, we use Lasix or furosemide 
as well as aldactone or spironolactone. It's often key that the patient monitor their weight at home while they're on diuretics, and this holds good if you're on diuretics for your heart or your kidneys as well, because that's the best way of knowing are you taking too much or too less medication, because if your weight is going up, you're retaining fluid. If you're losing too much weight, let's say you lose more than 10 pounds in, in the first week of starting your water pill, you need to let your physician know that because you may be taking too much. So this is a schematic now of uh, how varices look. So these are uh, dilated blood vessels that surround your stomach and your food pipe. And they occur because the liver is scarred, so blood cannot enter through the liver, sort of like a traffic jam there. So it starts taking these little country roads back up to the heart. And those little roads are not meant to handle this much traffic in terms of blood volume. So what happens is you're going to start having accidents. You're going to have blood seeping through because these vessels are not designed to take that much blood back to the heart. So that blood seeps through into your stomach or food pipe, and then you start throwing that up. So that's how you bleed from varices, which are nothing but dilated blood vessels that are trying to handle all this blood flow that cannot get past the liver because of the scarring. So how do we help people with, uh, uh, with varices? Certain uh, beta blockers, which are used to lower blood pressure, um, you may be taking these if you have high blood pressure, but they also reduce blood pressure in these blood vessels, so reduce the risk of bleeding. Certain intravenous medications can be used, such as vasopressin or octreotide, and usually we use this if a person comes in throwing up blood into the hospital and you know, we treat them acutely using these two medications. And then finally, there's endoscopic treatment known as banding, which I'll talk about, as well as um, a shunt that can be placed to shunt blood through the liver um, so it sort of bypasses the scars. So uh, this is something that gastroenterologists um, can perform. Um, this is a schematic of an endoscope fitted with a band ligation system. And the scope goes down into your food pipe. And what it does is it sucks up these blood vessels and band ligates them, sort of like putting a knot or a rubber band over them. And that's how it looks. That's a blood vessel that's been banded. And this is pretty good treatment. Um, for someone who comes in who's bleeding, uh, who's bleeding acutely. It, it may also be good preventive treatment for uh, someone who has very large varices that are uh, visible when you do endoscopy. Again, this is something that's seen in end-stage liver disease. Um, it, it may not be seen in someone who just has plain fatty liver or plain hepatitis B or C till it's a little more end-stage. So I talked to you about the shunt, and it's known as a TIPS shunt, which is a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. I don't expect you to remember that, but most people just uh, call it by the name TIPS. And uh, what it does is um, the physician passes a guide wire into the blood vessel that enters the liver. And here's a liver that's uh, scarred quite a bit, and blood is not getting through to the heart. So what they do is they create the shunt, uh, which is an artificial either a polymer or a metal stent that sits there and shunts blood through the liver past the scars. So moving on to encephalopathy, which is a state of mental confusion or uh, decreased consciousness that you may see in uh, certain folks with liver disease. Um, a, a laxative by the name of lactulose helps because it binds ammonia. Ammonia is a toxic waste product that your body produces. The liver helps excrete that or helps detoxify that. And people with liver disease have increased ammonia levels in their blood. And what lactulose does is it is fermented in your, in your digestive system to an acid which binds ammonia. 
um, and then is excreted in your bowel movements. Certain antibiotics may help, such as rifaximin. These, uh, these antibiotics are not absorbed, uh, but they're excreted. Um, and what they do is they reduce bacterial overgrowth, which may be causing more ammonia production in, uh, in certain people with liver disease. The other thing to remember is when someone with bad liver disease who was otherwise doing well, who was otherwise compensated, who was able to go about their daily activities, now suddenly gets encephalopathic. So they're a little more confused now, they're a little less arousable. It could be a precipitating factor, such as infection, dehydration, increased doses of any sedative or alcohol ingestion, or even something as simple as constipation, which may tip them over, um, because all these affect the liver and its ability to detoxify. So they may need admission and they may need one of these to be treated in order for them to, to wake up or become less confused. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about liver cancer, which is a complication of liver damage. Most, most conditions that damage the liver can cause liver cancer. But specifically, hepatitis B and hepatitis C can cause liver cancer. They're more prone to doing that. Alcohol and uh, iron overload can also increase the risk for liver cancer, which usually occurs in a scarred, damaged liver. Because as the, li as the liver tries to repair itself, the existing liver cells try and divide and multiply and when they have to do that several times in order to regenerate, they may make a mistake and the DNA is not copied properly and you have a cancer cell. So it usually occurs in a liver that's already damaged and trying to regenerate and it forms a cancer cell by mistake. So that's how a schematic looks and that's how it may look on a CAT scan. This can be monitored and diagnosed by checking tumor markers, and that's part of why monitoring hepatitis B and C includes checking for those tumor markers, as well as either doing an ultrasound, which is cheap and has less radiation as compared to a CAT scan, but sometimes a CT or MRI is needed to confirm this. There are various methods available to treat liver cancer. One of them is uh, radiofrequency ablation, where a radiofrequency probe is inserted through your skin under ultrasound guidance into the liver tumor. And then radiofrequency is used to burn the tumor. If the tumor is really large and cannot be burnt that way, one could use TACE which is an acronym for transarterial chemotherapy, where the chemotherapy is introduced into a big vessel that's feeding this tumor, which reduces side effects because you're not taking the drug through your mouth or intravenously, but you're getting it through the artery that feeds that specific tumor. The definitive treatment is usually surgical resection or liver transplantation but usually is not an option because these people are so sick from liver damage um, that usually you cannot resect it, you cannot remove it. You would have to transplant them. Um, or if the tumor is spread beyond the liver, then you can get palliative chemotherapy with a medication known as sorafenib. So we talked a little bit about how liver transplantation can be useful, both for liver cancer, if it is in an early stage, as well as for liver failure from any of these causes that we talked about today. Um, so this is a schematic of how a transplant is performed, and as you can see, it's a pretty technically challenging procedure. Uh, one would have to cut the inferior vena cava, which is a large blood vessel into which the liver drains and you resect the patient's own damaged liver 
but then you've also got to resect the bile tubes that drain the bile juice, the blood vessels that supply the liver. And once you've done that, you've got a lot of suturing to do with the transplant liver. Back to the inferior vena cava, common bile duct, hepatic artery, portal vein. So liver surgeons or transplant surgeons need to be really skilled with vascular repair, as well as general surgery. Um, and as you can see, several complications can occur if one of these anastomoses, the junctions either leak or become narrow or there's infection. So liver transplantation is, is first of all not for everyone. And even when done safely and correctly at transplant centers, can still have several complications. And once a transplant organ is placed, you still need lifelong immunosuppression to suppress your own immunity towards the transplanted liver. So the best method is to prevent liver damage in the first place rather than end up in this final scenario. But there are a lot of people with liver transplants out there and there are significant majority who do really well. Um, and this is available here in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area. But we do need more organ donors. So um, that's something you want to think about. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to summarize um, what we talked about. So the liver is an important organ. It, um, may not be as important as your brain or your heart, but it's, it ranks really high up there. And a healthy diet as well as a lifestyle is key to maintaining your liver health. Vaccination to hepatitis A and B may still be indicated for some of you, and you can talk to your physicians about that. It now is universal at birth for all children born in the United States. Maintain an ideal body weight, which may be easier said than done, but one does need to attempt to reduce weight if one is obese. If you are diabetic, keep your diabetes under control. And alcohol only in moderation, like we talked about. And if, if you actually have liver disease, you don't want to drink alcohol at all. And look for side effects from medications and minimize exposure to uh, medications that damage your liver. And um, encouraging organ donation is probably a personal thing um, for many people, but um, we do need more liver donors if there are more people who are going to be suffering from liver disease. So I'm going to stop here and um, ask if anyone has any questions. If we have questions, we have a microphone, we'll come around to you. What's the difference between, I believe it's the two liver tests, like the AST and another one, um, are they the same, or why do they have two or more? Right. That's, that's a good question. The question was, um, the liver function tests, commonly you refer to AST and ALT, but there are several more, as you mentioned. Um, those two are the main liver enzymes that are produced in the liver and do certain functions for the liver. And normally they're supposed to stay within the liver. So you can measure them in the blood, but usually they're at a very low level because they have no function being in the blood. But in liver damage, they both leak into the bloodstream and you find them in larger quantities. And um, you can find subtle differences based on which liver disease you have with AST versus ALT. Um, and that's why we measure both. It also gives us a clue to, is this more of a gallbladder problem or a liver problem? Or is it getting better or worse? So there are actually several things we monitor, including albumin, bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, your platelet count, and your INR. But um, the, the main purpose of monitoring is to decide which part of your liver or how exactly your liver is being damaged or what the most likely cause of liver damage is.
I had a blood test and it showed mine was elevated four times the normal amount and the doctor says I have fatty liver. Will milk, the, I stopped taking my simostatin Okay. because it had raised it once before. Will it come back to normal after stopping that medication? My cholesterol was down to 168. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. If, if uh, your simvastatin was causing the liver numbers to go up, it should come down when you stop the medication. It, it may take a while, it may take a few weeks before it comes back completely to normal. But if you do have fatty liver on an ultrasound, then, then the fatty liver may be also causing some uh, rise in your liver function tests. What about milk thistle? Milk thistle is not an FDA regulated product, but if you can find pure milk thistle and you trust whoever makes it, because the FDA doesn't regulate it, so anyone can say they're making milk thistle and package it. But uh, milk thistle has been shown in some studies that it may help liver disease. So it's probably okay as long as it's, uh, as long as it doesn't have any impurities. Okay. I think we have a question up front here as well. Uh, what about keeping a healthy liver, about the, uh, the detox, uh, the, all the substances which are sold in health store, about the liver detox, organic and all that? Right. Personally, I cannot vouch for anything that's sold in a health store. I'm sure there are a lot of good companies out there who make good products. But that's why we, ha we have the FDA, so that there can be some regulation, which is why prescription medications, there's a rigorous quality control process that makes sure that if you buy an aspirin, it really has aspirin in it, and the dose is the same when you buy an 81 milligram aspirin here in Fremont or you buy it across the country in a different store. The products that you buy in a health store are not regulated, number one. So you don't really know what's in there. Number two, there is no magic bullet here. There is no liver detox medication that I know of that'll cure all liver disease. So other than milk thistle, um, I don't think there's much data out there uh, for the colon cleanse, uh, liver detox, gallbladder detox uh, products that you get. So at this point, I have to say I cannot vouch for them more data is available.